even though the sampling is not yet finished at the Smurfit Stone site, we know from other paper mills that have closed in the last decade in the Pacific Northwest that they typically contain dioxins, furans, PCBs. Those contaminants are possibly moving up the food chain and affecting human health. Though there are more implications to this than just human health. Based on the data we have right now, which is limited, and that's why we need to do additional um, sampling, but it looks like that the alluvial groundwater has the contamination from the mill site. Hi, I'm Kelly Decker. You may recognize me from such fictional films as Disaster Wars, Earthquake vs. Tsunami, but I'm here today to talk to you about a real-life disaster that's taking place much closer to home. The Clark Fork River runs through the heart of Missoula, Montana, and is now home to one of the biggest environmental Superfund complexes in the western United States. My name's Keith Large. I'm a project officer or a project manager at Montana Department of Environmental Quality, and uh, I've worked here almost 17 years. Well, as a project manager, I work on federal Superfund sites, so I'm the uh, state's or the Department of Environmental Quality's uh, technical person that works on the different projects. The Environmental Superfund is a defined process the EPA undertakes to clean up hazardous materials and keep those materials from leaching into other areas. The Frenchtown site started in 1956. 1957, I think it all came online. It took them a year or two to build it. And uh, <clears throat> so the Frenchtown mill ran for a long time when there wasn't a lot of environmental regulation in. Horner Waldorf built the Frenchtown Technologies and Industrial Center in late 1957. 20 years later, Champion International purchased the Waldorf Holdings and acquired the mill site. In 1986, Champion, just before Champion became International Paper, sold the property to Smurfit Stone. Smurfit Stone declared bankruptcy in 2009 and ceased operation. After over four years of sitting stagnant, the holding ponds of the mill still retain a great deal of water, not to mention the soils and groundwater beneath the surface. You know, I don't know why they haven't run a study on down below there. Joe Cantrell operates a fishing guide service in St. Regis, Montana. I've been, I go up and down this thing 150, 175 times a year, you know, just myself. I don't know how long, personally, a rainbow or a cutthroat live, but it, it's got to be five, six years anyway. And uh, there's some fish in here upwards of 30 inches long. St. Regis is roughly 56 miles downstream from the Smurfit Stone Mill. All I know is uh, the stone container place up there, I'd sure like to see that cleaned up. Workers at the mill created a pure white piece of paper by bleaching wood fibers in a chlorinated solution. I know when they stopped uh, the bleaching process, whatever that, that was there, that uh, whatever was being dumped in the river at that time really had an effect on our bug life, the hatches in the river. And when they stopped that, that, that really helped. At Frenchtown, when it first started in the 50s, it was a pulp mill, and right from the beginning they started making bleached pulp. Now, bleached pulp is for making white paper. So you have a tree and you chop up the little wood chips and they're still going to be kind of brown in color, but if you want a pure white paper, you have to bleach it. And in the bleaching process, uh, dioxins are formed. 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-p-dioxin is the dioxin that could be formed during the chlorine bleaching process at pulp and paper mills worldwide. It may be the dioxin formed as part of the paper bleaching process at the Smurfit Stone Mill. An organic compound, chlorinated dibenzo-p-dioxins, dioxin-like PCBs, and furons are a family of 75 different chemical compounds. 
To understand the danger of this molecule, Agent Orange, one of the U.S. military's rainbow herbicides, was dropped on Vietnamese jungles during the Vietnam War to clear vegetation. In 1969, the public was informed that the Agent Orange dropped on Vietnam as part of Operation Ranch Hand was contaminated with 2378 tetrachlorodibenzo P dioxin, and that the dioxin contamination caused the adverse human health effects that were associated with exposure to Agent Orange. With the site in its present condition, and with the mill having loomed over the area for better than five decades, not a lot of people alive today can remember what this area looked like before the mill, the holding ponds, and the wastewater lagoons were constructed. Well, I know a little bit about the Smurf and Stone Mill, the fact that it's closed, the fact that it's under different ownership, um, and the fact that currently we're considering uh, designating it as a Superfund site. The mill is almost like leaching toxins into the river. So I was thinking about taking my young daughters uh, fishing on that river, how nice that'd be to float it in our canoe. And, and uh, the instant, the thought that comes to mind instantly is, uh, well, we wouldn't keep those fish, I assume. You know, I'm not real well informed on the lasting impacts. I know that it's there. Beyond that, I don't really know very much about it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not aware that there's any, um, that there was a distinction between the pollution from the Frenchtown mill. I don't also know a lot about the Frenchtown site other than it also is contaminated with a lot of um, sediments and I think there's metals and stuff like that from what I've heard in the water systems out there and they actually are in the process of trying to have uh, Missoula County declared as an official EPA Superfund site. If a person was to just go upstream, not very far from the Frenchtown site, to Council Grove State Park, it's probably three or four river miles just upstream. You have a reference point up, upstream to show you that what was probably pretty close to natural versus uh, industrial site. It's pretty clear that prior to uh, the development of the site for industrial, that was a huge floodplain. Basically, they've taken the river and diked it and, and, and pinned it against the valley wall. Um, and right now, um, it's, not, it's not only an unnatural um, position for the river and the riparian area has been heavily impacted. The area next to the mill, um, if it does have high levels of contaminants, um, if that dike is ever breached and that dike is not a certified levee, um, all those contaminants could be exposed to the river and could end up downstream and affect all those communities and river sections downstream as well. Moving an entire river had to have serious impacts on the environment and on the woodland and aquatic creatures that interact with this environment. Well, before the mill was built, it would have been um, just a, a floodplain and perhaps the wetlands of the Clark Fork River. Um, probably flooded um, in the spring. Obviously, it's changed a lot since then. They built dikes to uh, to build, you know, to separate it from the river so that they could build um, wastewater ponds to hold their discharge. You can still see traces of the old uh, river channel um, through those wastewater ponds. Uh, so we know that the channel moved around. Now it's confined between that berm and the, uh, the cliff on the other side. Water is central to everything that we do, not only in the West, but all around the world. In an attempt to clean the visible garbage out of the Clark Fork River, residents of Missoula have been getting together over the past 11 years to participate in an annual Spring River cleanup. I'm Karen Knudsen, I'm Executive Director with the Clark Fork Coalition. We've been working for 29 years to help make the waters of the Clark Fork cleaner and rivers healthier for the people, fish, and wildlife who live here. So because it's a very comprehensive mission, we end up involved in all manner of issues, um, from Smurfit Stone pollution issues to the upper Clark Fork mining waste that have been sitting on those banks for decades. We've been doing the Clark Fork River cleanup for the past 11 years. And the idea came out of um, community members and citizens who would approach us asking, what can we do to help this river? We had been working for years and years to protect and restore the Clark Fork watershed. And I think the needs of the river were starting to ele elevate in people's minds. 
So we decided let's organize an annual river cleanup. And the goal of this day is to bring people together to do a little spring house cleaning on the seven and a half miles of the Clark Fork River that runs through Missoula. Volunteers will fan out and they will pick up trash that has gotten away from us over the course of the winter and they will haul away debris that really shouldn't work, in, work its way into the river before spring runoff. Most of the interesting trash ends up washing up the banks just right in the sort of central downtown area of the Clark Fork River. I'm Rachel. We always bring our kids down. It's good. It's a really good event, but I wish there was less trash every year. You can hold it. <laughs> Bridget, tell us the weirdest thing you picked up today. Um, I found some really peculiar things. I found a no parking sign, and me and my friend found a tire, and we also found a lot of trash. Well, I didn't find it, but um, I heard there was a dishwasher down there, and my son Benjamin and I probably found a thousand cigarette butts. My name is Mandela Leola van Eerden. And I'm here because I work for the Trail 1033, part of the Montana Radio Company, and they were one of the sponsors of the Clark Fork River Cleanup. I host an outdoor adventure radio program on the Trail 1033 called The Trail Less Traveled. That airs on Sunday nights at 6 p.m., Tuesday nights at 10 p.m. The reason I'm here is because I was wandering around during the cleanup, interviewing the Clark Fork Coalition, interviewing volunteers, interviewing children about the Clark Fork River. So what I found out was that there's a lot of garbage in the river. There's a lot of little garbage, micro trash, like cigarettes and pieces of glass. There's also larger garbage, like shopping carts, uh, plastic Christmas trees, cars, tires. And just because when you throw something into the river, you don't see it anymore, it's going to go downstream, right? It's going to get caught in an eddy. It's going to be caught in a hole behind a rock. Someone always lives downstream, right? We have to continue to clean up the river. Um, you're walking down the river, you see a piece of trash, pick it up. We're floating down the river as a whitewater rafting guide and we see a tire. We get the tire out of the river, we put it in the, in the raft, we float downstream and we dispose of it properly. Putting things in the river is not disposing properly, right? I mean, even when the mill was active, they had pipes that came out of the settling ponds and released affluent into the river. Matt Potter owns the Kingfisher Fly Shop in Missoula. He says he's watched wastewater from the mill flow into the Clark Fork River, something that's happened for nearly 60 years. My understanding is that it was predominantly organic. Um, I never personally observed any health issues with the fish. Whether they were picking stuff up in their tissues, I don't know. It had to go down the river somewhere, you know, and uh, that's got to be that isn't laying in these slow water eddies around here has got to be laying in that dam down there. Because we can see them, it's easy to pull cigarette butts, plastic pipes, dishwashers, and parking signs from out of the river so that they don't end up downstream killing or poisoning fish, birds, and other aquatic creatures. But it's a little harder to clean invisible garbage, such as environmental pollution from out of the river. We did find some environmental contamination at the site. Uh, that consisted of dioxin compounds, uh, metals including lead, arsenic, and manganese. Initial assessment manager Rob Parker joined the Environmental Protection Agency in 2009. Um, I, I understand that, that uh, there's been a lot of work done um, uh, in terms of environmental contamination that, that's related to the Clark Fork River. This is actually the first time that I've worked on a site that's that's been associated with the Clark Fork River. Um, the Clark Fork River is, is one of the, the boundaries of the, the property um, uh, associated at the Smurf and Stone Mill site. There are already five different Superfund sites located upstream from the Smurfit Stone site on the Clark Fork River. This project is the first Clark Fork River project Parker is associated with. We found uh, elevated levels of manganese in the surface water and elevated levels of a dioxin compound in the sediment of the Clark Fork River. 
previous studies say it's clear that the water is unhealthy. The unanswered question is how far this contamination has moved downriver. And Montanans won't get these answers unless the Smurfit Stone Mill becomes a national Superfund site. The EPA plans to do a remedial investigation to determine the nature and extent of contamination uh, to, to evaluate, if any, uh, what cleanup needs to happen at the site. Parker says contaminated water and sediment from the mill site could have washed downstream hundreds of miles past Knox and in Idaho into Lake Pond Oreille and even beyond into the Columbia River. The next step is to, to, to complete the remedial investigation. Uh, that's designed to determine the nature and extent of contamination, which, uh, which goes towards determining what, if any, uh, steps may be necessary to remediate at the site. Before the EPA studies a larger stretch of the Clark Fork River, the Smurfit Stone Mill will have to move past the initial Superfund testing phase. If it does, a different project manager will conduct tests to evaluate what risks this former industrial site poses to human health. That remedial project manager's task is to, to perform a more detailed uh, remedial investigation to determine the full nature and extent of contamination. EPA project officer Sarah Sparks worked for the Montana Department of Environmental Quality before she joined the EPA in 1987. The most important thing um, that you need to know before you start cleaning up the site is what's there. Right now, the Smurfit Stone Mill is in the first step of the Superfund process, the initial assessment that was completed in 2012. The second step is where Superfunding begins. That's when scientists conduct tests to determine the total extent of contamination and all the hazards involved. And what that means is, what kind of contamination at the, is at the site and how much of it is there? Is it affecting groundwater, surface water, uh, people's drinking wells, air, uh, soil contamination? After the agencies discover where and how the contamination is entering the river, they will ascertain how far contamination has spread downstream. Then they will know more about the hazards to human health. The agencies will then begin the feasibility study. This is a study that looks at the different methods the EPA could use to remediate or clean up the toxins. From there we move into what we call the record of decision or ROD process. The record of decision is based on what officials think are the best methods to clean up the toxic materials. When state and government agencies support this decision, the actual cleanup begins. Sometimes waste is left in place and treated in place. It all depends on the site. I've never worked on any of these super fun sites that are the same. They're all different. Um, they're all complex and have different issues. After cleanup is finished, the site enters the operation and maintenance step, and officials monitor and do any maintenance needed to assure the pollution is not recontaminating the environment. And Smurfit Stone closed its doors in late December 2009. Since then, the property has changed ownership, first to Rock 10, and then to its present owner, the Green Investment Group. Green Investment Group has made the decision to close its doors to public comment and speculation until the Environmental Protection Agency makes its decision to include or not to include the site on the national priorities list. Green Investment Group corporate president Ray Stilwell says the company is concerned about the previous testing. He says federal and state samples would not have been able to ascertain whether pollution was from the mill, the Missoula wastewater facility, or even from the other Superfund sites that are already located upstream of Missoula. With the paper mill sitting idle and empty today, it is difficult to say what processes were used during its operational era to protect the environment from the dangerous chemicals that were used in the industrial activities that took place there. Our search for answers concerning what tests and precautions were used at the former Smurfit Stone Mill leads us to the Missoula Wastewater Facility. My name is Pat Clifford and I'm a lab tech here. So uh, I worked, um, before I got this job, I worked out at the pulp mill out at Frenchtown and I worked in their lab, you know, but that was, and you know, they had um, a lot of the same testing that we do here. So, uh, you know, we check the pH, we check the ammonia, the nitrate, phosphorus, like we do here. Um, 
Uh, there's a lot of, you know, they do the DO, uh, dissolved oxygen in both, uh, you know, in around the, uh, the settling ponds and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and they also did the air quality stuff at end of it too, but, you know, we don't do any of that here, so. Uh, they also did, I believe they did, um, they may have checked a couple of spots on the river as well, but don't quote me on that one. Since Clifford explained that in its operational period, the Smurf at Stone Laboratories did some of the same testing that is currently being conducted at the Missoula Wastewater Facility, let's see how wastewater is disposed of properly into the Clark Fork River. Why you would treat it? To get rid of uh, all the, uh, well, there's, there's um, solids, there's bacteria, there's um, you know, plastics, all sorts of, uh, well, gross and nasty stuff. The city of Missoula treats on average 7 million gallons of wastewater each day. This treated water is then released into the Clark Fork River. In order to ensure that the wastewater is not polluting the river system, the facility conducts regular testing with samples taken from the river. Uh, my name is Jerry Bika. Uh, I work for the city of Missoula wastewater plant and today we're taking river water samples at two, four sites total, two on the uh, Clark Fork and two on the Bitterroot for uh, testing for the lab for folks to test for phosphorus and nitrogen. For each site, there's four bottles. For one site that changes each, each time we go out, it's a duplicate so they can kind of test their um, results against another set. They want um, two taken on the, the Clark Fork. One is above the plant, um, and then another one is below the plant after our effluent goes into the, the river water, just to make sure that uh, if what our contribution is or if it amounts to anything or just what level it is. So that's the main thing, main reason for uh, above and below the plant sites for our testing, the lab testing. It's a nice walk. It's uh, a lot of people come walk their dogs down here and whatnot. I think during high water there could be an issue with um, where I might need to take a pair of waders, possibly. Just to get down there, but uh, I think the city maintains it on some level, with you know, a little bit anyway, oversees it. There we go. Well, this site we're checking now is uh, below the plant. So it's our second site on the Clark Fork. And uh, just kind of, again, check and see. I guess the lab folks could tell you more about it, but pretty much what, what if any contribution um, the plant makes towards water quality. And again, I rinse the dipstick to make sure that our sample's pure, and I mentioned earlier all these bottles have been acid washed by the folks in the lab, so we know that uh, the sample we take is a good one and stays that way. done till next time. Turn this over to the folks in the lab so they can do their thing.
that's ready to filter, so. After this is all filtered, I'll rinse this bottle, I'll pour it all back in here, and then we'll preserve it for the um, ammonia and the nitrate and um, soluble phosphorus and TPN we freeze. We take them out of the freezer and warm them up and then we've got that uh, an auto analyzer across the room there that we set up. So this side here, this box is showing us all of our concentrations and you know we run about 40, 40 some samples today in about an hour and a half. It's actually we're running the two tests simultaneously, ammonia and nitrate. This side here is um, for, for ammonia and this side over here is for our, our nitrate. And it, the computer is doing um, the two sets at this exact same time. Okay. So now our, our second sample came back and you can see it's got a lower peak so the concentration is going to be lower and on the ammonia side it's uh it's still low so it's it, we're not going to get a peak the organic compounds at the smurf at stone mill were a little different than the organic compounds delivered to the wastewater treatment facility as the compounds differ so too do the treatment measures since the mill is decommissioned and inoperable in its present condition, we may never know what truly went on at these wastewater ponds. If the Smurfit Stone site moves past the initial assessment phase, officials will face another problem. There are already five different Superfund sites that have already polluted the waters of the Clark Fork River before it reaches the mill. With the amount of environmental damage that has been identified in the river that runs through it, it will be hard for officials to pinpoint where certain toxins have entered its channel. I'm not quite sure if you can fingerprint them to determine where they're from, but what we do need to do is to look at upgrading sources from the Smurfit site to determine if we're actually getting contamination from the Bonner Mill or from other areas that may have dioxin or furans associated with them. DEQ Superfund project manager Keith Large says these studies are important to ascertain where the pollution is originating because it enables officials to mitigate them and stop the pollution from further contaminating the river. Now studies can be done to try to determine exactly where it came from but those studies haven't been done yet. If the EPA conducts additional tests in connection with the Smurfit Stone Mill and discovers that the toxins it found during the initial assessment entered the river upstream, federal courts could order the responsible parties to pay the costs incurred to clean up the toxic materials. Now the heavy metals or the metal contamination may be a bit harder to look at and determine where it's from, but certainly the dioxin furon is much different than what we've dealt with with the other cleanups on um, the Clark Fork from the mining waste. It is not clear how far this pollution goes, as the relevant tests to uncover these details have not yet been done. But it is certain these toxins have been discovered in fish taken from the Clark Fork River. You know, I've had people come in and tell me there was no fish in the Clark, and, and uh, the fish that were in there were all poisoned. And Study results distributed by the U.S. EPA show that insects in the aquatic ecosystem are some of the first organisms affected by pollution. I've, I'm sure the bug life is the first thing to go when, the, when the, it's really uh, badly polluted, you know. The Montana Department of Environmental Quality recently discovered that chemicals discharged into the Clark Fork River affect more than the insects. They also bioaccumulate, meaning they move up the food chain Anything that eats fish um, or eats things in the aquatic environment is going to accumulate a lot of these elements over time and could cause deleterious um, um, problems um, for their health. Research biologist David Schmetterling works as the fisheries research coordinator for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. He began his studies with pollution issues related to the Clark Fork River in the mid-1990s. The effects of PCBs, dioxins, and furans in the environment all 
of which are common byproducts of the pulping and paper mill industry um, are present at this site and their role in the environment is, is very, very complicated. It's going to take a while to really understand um, you know, the effects to aquatic life and those animals also that depend on aquatic life. According to the Centers for Disease Control, contamination can occur in many ways. Breathing smoke particulates, ingesting or touching contaminated water, or eating plants or other animals that have been exposed. It gets stored up in animal flesh and tissue, and that's why long live fish and fish that eat other fish accumulate toxins. The effects of um, Elm or um, compounds that are commonly referred to as you know, PCBs, dioxins, and furans. They're a suite of elements that are all cancer causing in people, um, and they've been linked to a lot of different health effects in people, and they have really complicated effects in fish. It's not as though they just kill fish outright or anything like that, like we see with other, other toxins in the environment. So copper, cadmium, zinc, or those are the primary um, pollutants um, uh, from hard rock mining. And those aren't the ones that we're testing for um, at Stone Container. In 2013, we did some preliminary investigations into um, uh, fish downstream of the mill, ones that would be, be most likely in contact with effluent from the mill. They caught these fish and they took tissue samples out of the fish and they found uh, dioxins and PCBs in these fish tissues. The state of Montana has advised that no one should eat the northern pike taken from the Clark Fork River and advised that a four meal a month limit should be adhered to when consuming the trout. It's not specifically no eat, they're severely limiting the number of fish you eat. Uh, you know, up until a few weeks ago when they put out this, uh, the word again about eating no pike, I don't know what effect that's going to have on, on my business here. But. Cantrell says it is too early to know how this consumption advisory will affect Montana's fishing industry. The majority of commercial fishermen and guided fishing adventures are catch and release, so this advisory doesn't really affect the commercial guides. I want to say 98% of our customers are all catch and release. 99% of the people I take are, are catch and release anyway, so they're not eating the fish out of the river. Fishing guides say most people who pay for Montana angling adventures are from out of state, and they travel to Montana without knowing about the consumption advisories for fish taken from the Clark Fork River. Probably don't even know about it. The ways a lot of the chemicals have gotten into the river, or potentially gotten into the river from the site, um, the, are, are diverse. There were, there was, um, there's settling ponds um, on the landscape there. There's the mill, there's uh, effluent releases where water is, you know, ostensibly treated water is released into the river, so it's a direct pathway. There's leaching through those ponds and through the groundwater. Um, you have to understand the whole site is in the floodplain. So there's already a connection between the surface water we see and called Clark Fork River and the whole mill site. Um, that's, that's the floodplain. The site has encroached into the Clark Fork River um, for decades. Um, so it's basically been built, you know, for lack of a better term, on the river or in the river. Studies conducted by the Centers for Disease Control say that people who recreate on the river downstream from the mill are at risk. I don't know if it works on the fish like it does on humans, but you can go for years, you know, with, the, with small amounts till it's too late, you know, and then it kills you. From invertebrates to things that eat those invertebrates like fish, and then the things that eat fish. Um, and then you can get very far off site. It's not just the fish in this case, it's anything that eats the bugs that live in the water. For years, um, when Stone Container was operating, it, a lot of the um, floodplain that was developed for their settling, settling ponds um, acted as a wetland, you know, I, and an artificial one. But those settling ponds um, fostered a lot of, a lot of birds especially seasonally, um, migratory waterfowl would stop in there. And we don't yet understand the impacts that those settling ponds, um, birds feeding in those areas, um, whether they're migratory waterfowl or, or even osprey, herons, and other, other birds, um, 
or even songbirds. We don't understand um, the effects that the mill site has had or continues to have um, on other animals at this point. You know, I was, you think about the osprey, you know, that's all they eat is fish. So I would think, you know, for what I know about it, I would think in the, down the road, yeah, it has to have an effect. With, with eagles um, preying on fish and basically near the top of the food chain, um, if there are contaminants there, you'd expect them to accumulate and be more concentrated in the upper level predators. It's just a, um, it, it's a natural uh, phenomena you would see, you know, uh, at the top of the food chain, basically. The fish consumption advisory for the Clark Fork River is in effect for a 110 mile stretch from the confluence of the Bitterroot River to the confluence of the Flathead River. In that stretch of the Clark Fork River, there is bull trout. And those trout are native to Montana and they're on the endangered species list. The 110 mile stretch may not be enough. Trout are a salmonid species. Like steelhead, their ocean-going cousins, trout swim to the headwaters of the river or stream in which they were born to spawn. Therefore, it is understandable that every river that confluences with the Clark Fork River could contain contaminated trout at one point or another throughout the year. But fish consumption is not the only concern for human exposure. It's likely um, that these toxins persist in other places. For example, there's a lot of, um, there's irrigation that takes place um, downstream of the site. There's shallow groundwater wells. The pollutants have a number of paths to get into food, but so far, no state or federal agencies have looked into human exposure. So we're suggesting that to the EPA that those studies need to take place. The Agency for Toxic Substances says that people and animals can accumulate 10 to 100,000 times higher levels of these pollutants in their bodies than the levels that are recorded in the water, in the air, or the river sediment. According to the Center for Disease Control, most of the contaminants that the Environmental Protection Agency found in its initial samplings are considered dangerous carcinogens. These are linked to a number of health hazards, ranging from cancer, to diarrhea, to burning and itching rashes, to a number of other symptoms. Um, now, it's complicated, uh, not just technically and legally, but um, the current landowner did not operate the facility. They bought it out of, you know, after the bankruptcy of Smurfit Stone. The Green Investment Group planned to develop a biofuels refinery and manufacture wood pellets at the Montana site, but it had to stop the private cleanup process until the EPA reached a decision on the Superfund status. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether it's a Superfund site, um, a state Superfund site, federal Superfund site, or if it just gets cleaned up by a private entity as long as it's done properly. Green Investment Group declined to be interviewed concerning the property. The group purchased seven former Smurfit stone mills and has funded similar cleanup at three of them. Under federal law, all previous and current owners could be held financially liable. None of these folks have come to the state, to the DEQ, and asked if they could work out some kind of deal to start addressing the risk that are out there. EPA initial assessment manager Rob Parker confirmed that the former and the current owners have submitted comments to the EPA during the public comment periods in an effort to stop the Superfund process from going past the initial assessment stage. I mean the bottom line is it's private property and um, there's always several ways to get to the same end point um, but um, what it'll take is a commitment and uh, willingness of the owners of the mill to um, want to assess the situation and do a cleanup. Lad Notek is a managing biologist for the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks in Missoula and Mineral Counties. Thing in the river, it appears there's contaminants out there that need to be cleaned up. And so I don't really care how that's done, but if it needs to be a super fun site, so be it. But someone needs to take responsibility and clean up the site. The EPA in Denver folks are working on this. They had a public comment period about the site and they have to respond to every single uh, comment and document those. The more comments the EPA receives, the more time consuming the process becomes. But EPA has a process where I had mentioned earlier, they have to answer all these public questions, all these questions and uh, comments that were submitted to them during the public uh, process. Uh, there was a, uh, I think a 30 day public comment period that was then extended to 60 days and 
Um, they're trying, down in Denver, they're trying to work through all that. EPA Initial Assessment Manager Rob Parker says 93 groups and individuals have submitted comments. Even though the Superfund is a federally regulated program, the entities that created the environmental hazards in the first place will still have to pay for its cleanup. Uh, EPA's concerns are related to the environmental contamination that has occurred uh, at the site. Parker says the reason for the EPA's three-year delay is because it is attempting to work with parties who could be held financially responsible. But because the site has changed ownership so many times in the past, it is unclear who is responsible. Uh, and so our, our involvement at the site is to answer those questions. EPA project managers say it is imperative that responsible parties contribute to the testing procedures. This would reduce the amount of taxpayer resources needed to pay for the concentrated remedial efforts. But the other aspect of the cleanup too is it's extremely expensive and so, um, you know, the funding aspect always is going to tie in and so Superfund is one of those processes that forces uh, the work to get done even when it is extremely expensive. In comparison with former Superfund efforts that took place upriver in Butte, if acreage alone dictates the cost to clean up the 3,200-acre Smurf at Stone Mill site, then responsible parties could be liable to pay more than $300 million. That current owners are interested in taking care of some of it. John Ingen has been the mayor of the city of Missoula since 2006. I think what we've learned over time is unless folks are somehow required to engage in that cleanup, unless the responsibility, responsible parties are at the table, stuff doesn't get done. Green Investment Group attorneys stated to the Missoulian that there is insurance to cover cleanup costs. The EPA has the financial authority to cover the cleanup and then sue the potentially responsible parties to reimburse these funds. Somebody will probably not be happy if it's not listed. Of course, I can tell you the companies will probably not be happy if it's listed. So it's a two-way street. Um, it's also a public process. There were over 1,000 public comments submitted to the EPA concerning the Milltown Dam Superfund site upriver from the Smurfett Stone Mill, while the Milltown area was still in the initial step of the Superfund process, and it took EPA officials one year to add it to the national priorities list. Why then has it taken the EPA officials three years to sort through the mere 93 comments it received in connection with the Smurfett Stone Mill? My name is Jennifer Chergo. I'm a public affairs specialist at the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 8 in Denver. I'm the communications person. We have an engineer and a scientist, an attorney, a toxicologist, all assigned, and others, depending on the needs of the site, internally at EPA. And what I try to do is take what we are planning and the actions we're taking, decisions we're making, things we're doing at a site, try to take that information and make it understandable and communicate it to the communities that we're working in. 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-P dioxin may be the dioxin formed during the chlorine bleaching process of paper worldwide. 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-P dioxin contaminated the Agent Orange that was dropped on Vietnam as part of Operation Ranch Hand in the Vietnam conflict. And the 2378-dioxin is what caused all the harmful environmental and human health effects from that operation. With the toxin in the environment, such as Agent Orange contamination, why has it taken three years to at least begin remediating the environmental pollution that is associated with the Smurfett Stone Mill? A reasonable individual could deduce that some sort of internal aberration is occurring in the Superfund process as it is being applied to the Smurfett Stone Mill some sort of aberration that did not occur at Milltown and that current owners or the potentially responsible parties have something to do with the delay to begin cleaning up the toxins at the Smurfett Stone Mill and in the Clark Fork River. At, at other sites, my experience has been that if there is conflict, it often comes around decision-making points. There are creatures that subsist mainly on the fish and even eat the invertebrates in the waters. 
There is still much to be done in the realm of cleanup to rehabilitate the system's ecology of the river that runs through it, and that could take a considerable amount of time. I couldn't give you a timetable per se of how everything's going to go down. Uh, we will begin, look, do it, um, begin the process of dealing with companies or parties that had ownership in the site. Um, At this point in time, it's, it's too early to tell uh, how long that process will take. Federal law will require one or more of the former and present owners to pay for the remedial activities. The site's current owner, Green Investment Group, President Ray Stilwell, still hopes for a private cleanup effort. He says that cannot begin until the EPA makes its decision to list or not list the site. Cleaning up is a dirty game, ladies and gentlemen.